No, it's not that bad. It's not that bad, really. Don't put the anything. <laughs> oh, cool. I can't... I've gone with you on most of this. Will somebody please back me up on the M3, please? We'll have a if vote think... on the M3. Forget what it's like to drive. Hands up if you done. think it's cool. Hands up if you think it's uncool. Precisely, that's more for cool I win, thank you. <laughs> yes, but this isn't a democracy, this is top. <laughs> now. It's a lose-lose. You're gonna lose. Now, time to put our star in a reasonably priced car. Now, this one's got a restaurant, he's got three of them. From a tyre company. Shall we meet him? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Britain's best chef, apart from Ainsley Harriers, obviously, Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> How are you, Gordon? Ainsley Harriers. Ainsley Harriers. Ainsley Harriers. What? He's a comedian. I'm sorry, Ainsley Harriers not a chef. He doesn't even have a restaurant, Jeremy. He's a comedian he... and a presenter. He can knock up supper for a fiver. He can barbecue food. He gets the contents of a tin and a hoover bag. <laughs> knock them together. Five pounds, you can feed a family for a month. You, <laughs> five pounds for a sprig of parsley. <laughs> anyway, listen, in between opening like 25,000 restaurants, um, you've managed to dish up four children. Yes. So, under four. All under four. All under four, yeah. Nine men. What a man. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Thing to do. <laughs> Look at that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, it'll be empty by now. I have you, uh, <laughs> have um, you got a cushion? <laughs> um, yeah, four under four. But so, what do you do for a family car? Family car? It turned out a bit of a problem um, with the Range Rover because we couldn't never get all four seats in the back. So, um, Tana came up with the idea of buying a new Mercedes and got one of those ML uh, six-seaters. Yeah. So, uh, well, there's I, no boot in the back of that. There's definitely no boot in the back, no. But I don't really get sort of over-involved with those sort of, you know... You don't do the school <laughs> run. <laughs> I did once. And it was an absolute nightmare. Go on, talk, talk me through it. Well, it's, you know, 20 past eight in the morning. And you're driving along the sort of Wandsworth Road towards Battersea. And uh, the women now, the mums, don't double park. They treble park. <laughs> I have to say, though, rather amusingly, is that a few years ago, I was making a program about women doing the school run in Chelsea, turn up with a film crew outside a little school in Sloan Square. Who should pull up and treble park but Mrs. Gordon Ramsay? <laughs> I thought you'd forgotten about that. No, of course. How could I possibly forget? She's very attractive. Which is my key for not doing the school run, chaps. Okay? <laughs> what you do, volunteer. Okay? I'll do the school run this morning. Do it. The next morning, do it again. Next morning, do it again. Fourth morning, say to your wife, what are those mums at the school? Quite slim, aren't they? Let's <laughs> <laughs> do it again. Yeah. Okay. That's my thing. <laughs> Women drivers and vegetarians. And if we could just forget these congestion charges and have alternate days, one for women drivers, one for vegetarians, London would be a dream to drive around, no? How would this, how would this play? Is this good, do you think? You're a vegetarian. Get out! <laughs> he he Get does out. not look like a vegetarian. This, what the and hell are you doing? At his gardener's world is in Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> so I are you vegetarians? I quite like that idea. But I mean, they drive, you know, 15 mile an hour. Who vegetarians? Uh, yes. Do. Uh, they yeah. sort of don't look where they're going. They never indicate. And the minute there's a problem on the road, they sort of let go of the steering wheel. How are you able to tell that they're vegetarians? This is the one thing I like to think they are, of course. <laughs> yeah, because they just look. 
rather dodgy. <laughs> What's that? Pale and warm. And they need a bit... In need of a good bloody fillet steak and sort of, you know. <laughs> now, while we're on the subject of things that annoy us on the road, um, motorway service stations. We've all been there. What do you think of the food? Shockingly, disgustingly fad, pretty dismal, plastic. Um, <laughs> And expensive. Gross imitation food. Um, and before you go on any motorway, eat before you drive. No, because actually, funny enough, no need to eat before you drive. We had a bit of an idea. We thought, hang on a minute, you're driving along in a car which has a big, hot engine in the front. <laughs> Why not use that to cook your food as you drive along? So this morning we had an idea, okay? Okay, we'll just run some tape here. I'll show you what we did. This is a Subaru Forester. And strapped to its flat four engine, we have a succulent turkey breast and a reduction of porcini mushrooms and red wine garnished with winter sprouts. And what could be more delicious than that? Okay, this is the larder we turned into a lotus the other day, and that's being used to cook a baby rack of lamb with market vegetables. <laughs> Dressed in olive oil and Mediterranean herbs, right? Now, the Suzuki Liana, which will be cooking a wild salmon on a bed of lemon thyme, <laughs> accompanied by Pong's Top Gear. Vegetarian option there. <laughs> now, because we recognise, we know that fish is justifiable homicide. Meat's the murderous thing. You actually anyway, put them on there. Yeah, no, they're on the engines now as they're trundling along. And forget gas mask 6 um, or 450 degrees, the measurement here is red. We recommend 3,000 RPM for about two hours, okay? <laughs> So after two hours, I pulled one of them in. Okay, here it is. Let's have a little look how we're, uh, how we're doing. <laughs> uh, it's still a bit pink. I'll, um, I'll add some seasonings, see if we can mask the smell of engine oil in there and uh, send it back out again, I suspect. Best thing to do. There we go. Go back on the track, or the rotisserie, as we like to call it. <laughs> so really, we've kind of worked it out that if you were to set off from London, from where you live, go into Leeds, by the time you get to a Woodall Services near Sheffield, lunch should be about ready, okay? So they were trundling round our track this morning for two hours, and is the Stig here? We've finally allowed him to come out of the cold, and we've allowed him into the base. Can you bring the food over? Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, for the <laughs> first time ever in the studio, the Stig. Here it is. <laughs> You sample some of that salmon and well, tell me what you think. This was actually cooked on the engine. That In was the genuinely all of this food was cooked on the engine of a car. Tell me if that matches up to motorway service cooking. It certainly matches it, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that is slightly dry, a little bit overcooked, and um, so not Thanks. worthy of three stars, two, two stars? I wouldn't even give that um, one, one star. I wouldn't even give that one star, definitely. Not no. even one star? No. Oh, well, no. try a bit of lamb. Try a bit of lamb. Now, uh, just to remind everybody, this was uh, cooked on the larder, market vegetables, uh, dressed in olive oil, Mediterranean herbs. That's your sort of food, mate. <laughs> What do you think of his sort of food? <laughs> I think Gordon is about to be sick. You have some. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
Christmas sprouts. <laughs> Even the vegetarian likes this. Um, that taste of petrol, castrol, oily, and uh, greasy. Yes, it was cooked on an engine. That's why. And that's what tends to happen. The lamb, sadly, is overcooked. So 2,000 revs for two hours is far too long. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem, you see. We cooked it on a four-speed car. <laughs> Here's a tip. If you're cooking lamb, make sure it's five speed, preferably six speed. <laughs> okay. Who would like to see Gordon's lap? Yeah. Yes, yeah. let's play it. Come on. Looking cheerful. That's an aggressive start. That's the most aggressive start we've seen all series. Come on, you concentrate. Bloody hell, I could have swore just some traffic warning. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point of this track there are now. Now, let's just see how tight you are on that lot. Look at that precision driving, <laughs> mate. <laughs> that is precision driving. <laughs> <laughs> That's about 85 through there, and then that's it. Break it on first and turn. Break. Turn gently. Too early. <laughs> that's where most of us come off, but you're across the line. And. And. <laughs> Gordon. Gordon R. Now, these are the sort of times you're looking to be. It was a dry day, so you should be somewhere near the top, okay? Mm hmm. One minute, 50 seconds. Same as me, ladies and gentlemen. It's an epic time. That is an epic time. I'm obviously not going to put you above me. <laughs> Just be rude. Alphabetical order. Yeah, alphabetical <laughs> order. And, um, yes, G comes after J. <laughs> <laughs> On that world chart, it does. Anyway, Gordon Ramsay, it's been an absolute riot having you here. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> now, that's enough about food, OK? Let's see how the Jags' diet's getting along. Over the next three hours, the Cornish crew stripped every piece of excess fat from our beautiful XJS. Out came the spare wheel, the back seat, bumpers, and the soundproofing. As they say at fat clubs, no pain, no gain. But Jag fan Jason wasn't happy. No! Oh, no this is sacrilege! There goes the electric window like the sun. Oh, that's the headlamp wiper motor. Lights up. Everything the guys have pulled off the car has been weighed and it's all made a nice big pile. Yeah, they took off the uh, rear bumper, that was 20 kilograms. Uh, passenger seat, that was another 16 kilograms. Even the speakers, six kilos each. Apparently the ashtray was 0.27 of a kilo. But every bit counts, and it's come to a total of 223 kilograms. That should make a difference when we get it back out on the track. I don't care, they look, boys, you've ruined it. It was a lovely car. I don't know, I think it looks better, kind of rugged and manly. Anyway, let's get it out on the track and see what the Stig makes of it.
recap. Before we put our Jag on a diet, we tested it. 0 to 60 it did in 8.6 seconds. Then we put it on the diet, we stripped out a fifth of a ton of stuff and we lost so much out of it. Well, pretty much everything. Took out the seats, took out the trim, took out the bumper, the spare wheel. Don't bother looking in there, there is nothing to nothing. see. <laughs> <laughs> Shell. Then we tested it again. 0 to 60 time came down to 7.4 seconds. That's 1.2 seconds better. I think that's pretty incredible. No more power, just less weight. Yeah, but if you think that's quick, you, how much time do you reckon we save? 0 to 100 before and after. A couple of seconds straight. Five seconds. This car was five seconds quicker after we stripped it out. I think that's quite an achievement. That is a lot. So we have proved the point. But weight is the enemy not just of performance, it's the enemy of economy too. You waste a lot of fuel just lugging it around, so it costs you money. So, light is good, light is right, and light works. Anyway, this week's Insider Trading News, there's still deals out there to be done. One that turned my head this week, 4 by 4s right? Nissan do the X-Trail, but they still do the Toronto. Yeah. yeah. It's all right. It's OK. It's been around for a while. Yeah. 2.7 diesel, 5 door, that's normally 20 grand. But a 15 and a half, it's a bargain. Yeah, that money makes sense. That's 15 and a half. 4 and a half grand off that car. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it. That's a brand new car. Now, Toyota Avensis. You're a fan. Oh, it's a foul car. You've got a big problem, it's mate. It's disgraceful. It's not the best car in the world, but... Not the best. It should come with a taxi light on the top. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. Oh, Listen, second-hand, they are really, really seriously good news. I should hope so. Honestly, three, four-year-old ones, they're, they're fetching over book at the minute. Yeah. But there's a new one coming out next year, yeah. early part of the year. And what will happen, this is a tip for next year, what will happen is January, February, the old stock, the dealer's going to start discounting them. So if you're the kind of person that has a car and keeps it for four, five, six years, runs it into the ground, no, that's the car I want to keep an Avensis for five years. I'd rather have it for five days. Mate, you can <laughs> buy one. Buy one in the early part of next year. You'll get a discount on a new one. Run it for six years. It won't go wrong. It's a Toyota. That's very true. And when you come to sell it, it will hold its value. Will it? Yeah, it's a good car to buy. Now, if you buy a new car, you pretty much accept the fact you're going to lose money on it. Yeah. With the possible exception of this year, the Mini. Yeah, you pointed that out earlier. Yeah, run it for 12 months, make a profit. Now, my prediction is there's two or three cars next year that the same thing's going to happen on. Okay? Number one, BMW Z4. Nice car. Fantastic car. Very buy nice. one of those, run it for six months, 12 months. Chances are when you come to sell it, You'll either get your money back, or you might make a small profit. Do you reckon? That's yeah. just because it's going to be difficult to get hold of it. Absolutely. They won't build enough, so demand will outstrip supply, as it, as it always does. Mm. So that's a good one for you. Second one, VW Beetle Cabriolet. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> now, I know the Beetle's not everyone's cup of tea, but no. when they bring out the Cabriolet, wow, I think that's just going to have such a good effect on the whole brand. I think that car's going to hold its value fantastically. You'll probably make a profit if you buy one. Really? And the third one is the Nissan 350Z. Okay, 22 grand that car is seriously good value. I reckon people are going to queue up for that car, come out of TTs and all sorts. That'll be a car I think you could make a profit on. Now, since this program has a family car flavour, we thought it'd be a good idea to catch up at this point with all that's new and exciting in the world of the hot hatchback. I've always been a big fan of hot hatches because they were cheap, simple, and you got two cars for the price of one. On the one hand, they were as practical as a normal hatchback. You could use them for taking the children to school. But then, thanks to their big engines, you could drive home like your trousers were on fire. Recently, however, things have got all muddy and complicated. 
This Volkswagen Golf R32 costs £22,000, so it's not cheap. And it's not simple either. Quite apart from the safety and emission stuff that all cars have to have these days, I've got traction control, CD changer control, climate control, and heated seats, which of course are hemorrhoid control. All very nice. But luxuries like this add weight. So much, in fact, that this car weighs exactly twice as much as the original Golf GTI from 25 years ago. So, to move around at anything more than a trot, it needed twice the engine. And that's what it's got. The original had 1.6 litres. This has 3.2. The original developed 110 brake horsepower. This develops, well, slightly more than twice that, actually, 240 brake horsepower. Because it has twice the engine and twice the weight, that led to another problem. It needed twice as much grip. So, the original was front-wheel drive. This is four-wheel drive. So you're probably imagining at this point I'm going to say it's twice the car. Well, it's twice as substantial, that's for sure. It's twice as luxurious, it's twice as well made, it's twice as quiet. And bearing in mind the original didn't have power steering, it's twice as easy to drive. But it doesn't have the spirit of the original Golf. It's less fun somehow. It's like the new Mini, a better car than the original, but not as important. As a historical monument, then, it's thrashed. But as a 21st century flying machine, how does it stack up? In this market, in the blue corner, you have the Ford Focus RS. In the red corner, there's the Honda Civic Type R. And in the yellow corner, the Seat Leon Cupra R. This is a world of fat tires and aluminium add-ons, where the show matches the go. The Golf tries to compete. It has two exhausts, for instance, and lowered suspension and big wheels, but I don't know, somehow, it looks like the nominated driver at a New Year's Eve party. It's sober and restrained in a rainbow whirl of streamers and noise. Sure, the R32 is very, very fast. 0 to 60 takes 6 seconds. The top speed is 153. But I suspect it's more of a long-distance cruiser than a B-road barnstormer. The engine doesn't really like to be revved and the gearbox doesn't like to be rushed and the steering doesn't like to be rushed either. If you're quick with the wheel, you can actually beat the power assistance. It all suddenly gets very heavy, which is weird. 
And those of you of a tail slide disposition are going to be disappointed as well because it really won't play ball, no matter what you do. It's not brutal like the Ford, it's it's very soft actually, very forgiving. Think of it more in terms of being a, a long-term companion rather than a fiery one-night stand. So there we are. The oldest hot hatch of them all is acting its age. You know what? I feel as though I've grown up with the Golf. I was 17 when the Golf GTI came out. We've matured together so that now we're... Fatter? Fatter, yes. But wiser. A wise head on a fat body. <laughs> More importantly, how does it compare with the obvious direct competitor, the Ford Focus RS? Well, we're men, OK? So we have to quantify that. Therefore... Engage Stig Drive. The Ford Focus RS came here a few weeks ago and was four seconds faster around our track than a Subaru Impreza. And here it is again, blitzing the track. What's the time? What's the time? It's on one minute and 32 seconds. So that was the goal. Crosses the line in one minute, 33 seconds. Well, that's only one second behind the Ford. I know. And that means it's still three seconds quicker than an Impreza. It's an astonishing car. It really is. But you've got to admit, that Ford is incredible. Then again, you did have reservations. We, exactly. The very thing that makes the Ford incredible on a track, its front differential, makes it useless on the road. It's so twitchy, there's so much torque steer. Now this, yes, it's a second slower on a track, a big deal, mm -hmm. but on the road, it's so much more civilized. This, this is the car for me. Right, we are getting towards the end of the series, and still the Westfield XTR is at the top of the tree. It was the quickest car to get round our test track. But now it's coming under threat from two directions. First of all, there's this. It's the Radical SR3. And like the Westfield, it's got a 1.3 litre bike engine. But in the Radical, it's more powerful. So that's one threat. Then we heard from this guy, Tom. Now he got in touch and said, oh, I got something that can thrash anything around your test trap. To be honest, we get a lot of challenges like that. And most of the time, they're rubbish. But this time, he may have a point. Okay, so here's the stick warming up the radical. And this is what he'll be racing. It's a super light, super fast aerobatic plane. And Tom, the Stig's challenger, is the British aerobatic champion. Now, since the Stig isn't one for words, I'll be the go-between. Have a look at the opposition, OK? This is it. It's a radical SR3. Now, it's powered by a bike engine, 1300cc, but it puts out about 200 brake horsepower. That's compared to your plane's, what? 300. But this is the amazing bit. This only weighs 500 kilos. But your plane only weighs 600 kilos. Correct. So with the extra weight, they're quite evenly matched. Top speed here, about 150 miles an hour. Your plane? 200. 
But although the plane is going to be faster along the straights, it will lose out in the corners. A plane has a big turning circle, and our track is very tight. So to stay within the lines, Tom's going to have to climb violently and throttle back to lose speed, and that gives Stig the edge. Th this here, I'm going to have to climb uh, to lose speed to get back down the track here. So I'm going to be covering more distance and round here we're going to be drifting wider but you reckon you can stay pretty close to the track i think so yes okay is this going to work we will see have you done it before no wait The Radical can hit 60 miles an hour in three and a half seconds, 100 in 8.8 .8 seconds, so it has the edge from the start. It carries that lead into the first corner, because as soon as Tom's airborne, he's got to start climbing. He's going to have to throttle back straight away to make it round that first bend. Bearing in mind the G-force is here, that radical can generate 2G in the corners. That's a lot. The plane can manage 9.2. Once again, on the straights, he starts to catch up, but as soon as he gets near to the stick, he's got to climb again. Losing speed. That means he can make the turn, but that means the stick is ahead. Pushing these things about as far as they're going to go today. That plane's acceleration is awesome. But every time he gets near to the stick, every time he's got to climb again to make that corner. Straight. I think Tom's feeling more confidence he should be able to, and he is, he's edging past the stick! <laughs> but not for long, because this might be the final straight, it's not the final corner, there are two bends yet, and that means the stick could get ahead. Can he make it around faster? The plane's got to climb so high there to lose speed, that means the stick is edging across, will get over the line first, or will Tom swoop down on him and, and there he swooped and he's won Stig comes second Tom's my new hero definitely that was very cool but hang on a second it was a plane. We specify everything that goes on our board here has to be road legal. Yeah, if you took that plane to the shops, the police would stop you. Yeah. yeah. It's got no indicators, no brake lights, got no brakes. It's got wings, somebody would notice. Yeah, you can't park it either in the town centre. No. You'd just cause a menace. So, this is <laughs> true. So what matters here is the radical. How did it do? Here's a Westfield XTR, 1 minute 23, the Zonda 1 minute 23. Where's it going to go? Where, Where do we think? It? Faster? Higher? 122? I'll tell you what it is. It's 1 minute 19, 19 seconds. <laughs> 19. Is though next week the Germans are coming here <laughs> with a couple of cars that they think will beat the radical. We'll have a laugh at that. I mean, we'll see, obviously, <laughs> we'll see in a fair way how they get on. We're also going to be naming our car of the year and our quest to find Britain's fastest faith goes on. Remember, the Church of England currently hold the title, but will the Druid 
beat the Muslim? Will the Rastafarian win through? Good night. <laughs> And there's more next week at the same time. Next on BBC Prime, On the Edge of Adulthood, Teen Species at 16.